Okay, so our next next speaker is Eduardo Quintero. Uh, I don't know if you're there on the floor, Eduardo. Um, let's see. I see you there. <laughs> hello, Eduardo. How are you? Hello, hello, Natalia. Well, Eduardo and I uh, know each other for a long time, and now we work together for the Biennale. And Eduardo also has his own uh, company. We were uh, co-workers at Cesar Pelli a long time ago, and uh, you know, very close friends. So we're happy to work together again. Uh, thank you, Eduardo, for being here. I'm looking forward to see what uh, you're doing in Panama and around the world. And uh, you know, so I'll leave. Um, well. You know, I, I haven't formally introduced you. <laughs> I'm your friend. That's good enough. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Well, um, well, Eduardo, Eduardo initially, um, you know, moved to the U.S. Uh, to to study, and um, you went to Columbia in the school. Of I went again. I, I I I can I can maybe help you. I, in, two, in the next, year 1993, I came to the United States to study architecture. I'm from Panama. And then I studied in the University of Arkansas. And then I was very privileged. I, I, I thought that would be almost impossible, but I was able to go to Cornell, which is a great university. And I did my master's of architecture there. And then I thought, I, I, I did what was more impossible, which was to get a job at Cesar Pelli and Associates alongside with you, which was, as you well know, almost impossible to get. And, and it was a dream to work there. Cesar was a magnificent person. I learned so much from him. I worked for him seven years. And then, um, and then I also, while we were in New Haven, I was able to, to take courses like we, we, we all did in, at Yale. And then I was able to do some postgraduate studies at, at Harvard. Uh, with Ram Kulhas. And then in 2007, I decided that I wanted to come back to my roots in Panama. And that's where I formed Forza Creativa that I'll be talking to you about in the context of, of course, the interdependent city and collaboration. Well, thank you so much for your help. Uh, you know, I was <laughs> going to read your uh, CV, which is outstanding as the work you're doing. So um, we look forward to see it and I leave the floor to you. Okay. Thank you, Natalia. Thank you so much. Well, before I, I start with Forza Creativa, I must say that I am so honored and, and happy to be right now talking to all of you because I am a part of the New York City Architecture Biennial myself. I'm the Latin American representative alongside with other people who are working really hard. And, you know, these conferences uh, are the product of a lot of work and a lot of love and, and commitment to the, to the idea that it's important to learn and, and never stop learning. And so Natalia, to me, is very special to be here uh, in this very special day that we have been dreaming about. And I hope everybody is enjoying this, this conference. So I am here in the next few minutes, I'm gonna be talking about Forza Creativa, which is the firm I started after I finished at, at, um, at Cornell and then at Cesar Pelli. This firm is the, and I'll continue, um, one second. Oh, I need to share my screen, so one second. So this firm uh, already has 15 years. It looks like it's only like three, uh, time flies. But in 2007, me and Ana Maria Sampogna, uh, who you've been seeing um, maybe throughout the biennial as well, she and I formed this group, this company called Forza Creativa. This company is not called Eduardo Quintero and Associates, like many architects do sometimes, or Sampoña and Associates. It's called Forza Creativa, out of a wholehearted belief that collaboration is essential. It's not one person, it's not Ana Maria and I, two people. It's a group of multifaceted professionals that make up our firm, which have very firm and committed belief that architects and architecture matters. And we work in all scales of architecture. We do interior designs and objects all the way to the designing of cities. And we do it always with the same integrity and in the same sense of um, collaboration. 
with a, a firm that it, it's around 25 people. Um, and, and, and those are incredible, incredible talented people. And, and again, we work, as we all know, in architecture. I think architecture is the best example of, of an interconnected city. We work, everybody on their the mission it might sound naive and idealistic, but we do. Uh, we work with the belief that architecture, the profession of architecture matters, that actually is essential in this quest of an interdependent city of a world that is united and that picks up from the strengths of all. And so our mission is very clear. We believe that us architects have a great power and that with our work, we can, we can, com um, we can, com we can create and, and, and change behavior. We can create identity. We can create and inspire. And so it's funny. Sometimes I go to the office, it's late at night and I see people working so hard and I, and I wonder why are they here? I mean, like we should all like normal people are at their house with their family or going out or whatever. And there's every, you know, every, in our all architecture office and they're working so hard. And it's just because I think architects uh, never want to let down our profession, our profession, which, um, which is we, we in architecture school feel that architects have a mission, have a goal and that we're important. And it seems, at least in my office, like all of all, all the architects understand it and work really hard to demonstrate to our clients, to our society, our our our, our peers, what we can do. So in our in, in our particular office, we work with a very special recipe. We believe that uh, that projects are made out of uh, our, some projects are done arbitrarily. Some firms work in a more subjective manner. And, but we believe in a very rational and, and, and critical way of design in which is like a salad. We pick up from certain um, ingredients, which are the context, the program, sustainability, and poetry. Very simple um, pillars that are then included in every single project. So our projects, more than coming from our own um, experience or wisdom, comes from a system system that we have designed a creative system that uh, a creative system that has multiple and infinite possibilities that exceed our own capacities you know that we have as individuals so from the from the start we decided that really we wanted to have a super super high design and that we we and, and we were very clear that we alone do not have enough capacities to, ex to excel, so sort of surpass our, you know, th those levels of design we want. So we decided from the very beginning that we were going to, um, we were going to work system of design, which I'm going to be presenting today through the course of, of, of this presentation, which is how do we make projects based on this system of design, this creative system that is based on very particular um, sets of pillars. And before we do that, because we're talking about collaboration, I decided to put this, this, this diagram, which you maybe already know, uh, the Betty Crocker story of the ready mixed you know, recipes and, 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 and desserts and, and cakes. Um, and I only put it here because that we believe that's the way we design, which is in terms of collaboration and the client is, is most, most of the time the most important part of the team. Actually, from uh, Natalia, you might remember when we were working with Cesar Pelli, he would always say that the client was the most important part of a project and that actually the, 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 the level of or, or the, the, the quality of the project depended more than in the architect, it depended on the, on the level of the client. If we have good clients, we have good architecture. If we don't have good clients, we don't have good architecture. So I put this, 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 this graph here because there's a very good story that I'll just say for, for a second. When General Mills launched the Betty Crocker uh, ready to mix this, um, cakes. They had great success, but they it didn't meet the expectations they wanted. So they were trying to figure out how were they going to be able to maximize their revenue and create um, you know greater sales. And so they figured out that you know before the these the, 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 the cakes were already all mixed. You just had to add water, and the cake came fabulously. So they decided to instead. And this was very clever. Take out the part of the egg, and so the person buying the recipe, as we all know, had to crack the egg and mix it. And the act of mixing the egg on the powder and then making your cake made you a participant. Made made it just enough, not too much work, where you would be like, "Oh no, that's too much work." 
but made enough so you felt that cake was your own. At the end, when someone said, oh, that cake is delicious, you felt like, no, yeah, I cooked it because I cracked the egg. And so the idea in architecture would be, at least for us and our clients, is that we, we always want the clients to crack the egg. So they feel that the project is there. So it doesn't happen halfway through that I, I, we don't like that. It's like, no, 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 that project, we did it together. And remember throughout the process, what this was decided together. And so it's more difficult for them to, and they are very, they feel very proud and integral, an integral part of the, of the project. So this is a great analogy of how it worked for Betty Crocker and we've always used it for ourselves. So this is, so architecture for us is not just a personal or a, um, a challenge for the company, it's a challenge in which we work with the client. And then a funny story of the Betty Crocker, as we all know, you know, this was the first invention was the cracking of the egg, but later on they picked up on that people wanted to customize their cakes. And so they, they introduced the icing, which was, a, an, an incredible opportunity for then every single user to make a cake of their own with a different design to create like a heart on the top of the cake or put different designs with the icing. So the cake itself was already cooked with a ready mix, but by doing by by the by each user being able to customize and personalize their own cake with their icing, they definitely feel, felt like that that cake was not Betty Crocker. That cake was their own. And so we've always studied that and to see how we can incorporate the client in ways in which they don't go too much, but not, but also not too little. And so our design methodology is a methodology in which we, again, work with different pillars and we combine them and we create infinite results. It's a system, a, a creative system that goes beyond our own skills, our own knowledge, our own experience, or our, our own uh, knowledge of travels we've done by relying on a system the system alone designs, uh, and, and which is very, very interesting. Of course, this is a process of collaboration. We collaborate with clients, our teams. And so this, this is done not one, by one person. This system is done as a collaboration. And so I'm gonna tell you a few case studies uh, so you can see how this process goes into place and how interdependent, how everything is collaborative and, and, and it works really interesting. So for example, I'm just gonna do three or four projects of different scale, just to show you, this is a project uh, called Santa Maria Park, um, which was a big important site in the middle of a, a very unique context, a, a business district. And that business district and this project was submitted, was, um, was tested with these four pillars that we always use, context. So what does the context, the, the setbacks, the norms of the site, the streets, all the different aspects of the site, how does that inform the project? And we analyzed it, analyzed it, analyzed it. And we sometimes find very simple, like in this case, it was just crossing the site. We wanted to make a site in which you could cross like a bridge because the site, the blocks were really big. So for example, the context created that solution, that conclusion. Then we did the same with the program. The program was mixed use where we had retail on the ground floor. Well, it was not in the, they didn't tell us where, we just knew we had to do retail and offices. And so we, 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 we analyzed it and we tried to do by this system of the program, what was the best conclusion. And so independently, the program was giving us one conclusion and the context, another conclusion. And then we did the same with the sustainability and the poetry. The poetry is this untangible, which you don't know if it worked, the project made money or didn't make money, but it's unforgettable. Something that you always wanna go back and you feel great. So each one of these chapters created their own conclusions and then we mixed them and we created a project where you see here, where you basically see a little bit of the solution of the context where you have this, this passage way that we thought the context had to do as part of an analysis of the context. It has the program very clearly divided where you have the offices in the top and the retail in the bottom, very much like the solution that came out of the program. Then the sustainability, in terms of how the sun moved, created some overhangs in the retail that were important and, and the poetry, all of that combines. And then in this particular case, we worked with a client who cracked the egg to mix this because we could have said, no, 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 for us, it, the context is all that matters. And so the project would have been a lot more contextual. But in this case, it was mixed because the client working with him and mixing the ingredients, we came up with this particular solution. So this in our mind is, the best solution for the context, the program, the sustainability, and this quest of poetry 
with the particular client. If we had had another client, we would have done the mix probably a, diff a little bit different. So this is one first example of how we have done it. This is a beautiful project in, that is in construction in Panama. This is another project. This is a very large scale project. It's almost a city block in which um, the clients wanted to do a mixed use project. And so we, again, did the same type of analysis. What does the context tell us? The context is this amazing urban site that has been re re revitalized through a urban um, redesign and it's full of sidewalks and an incredible place. It's very urban. And so that context gave us some conclusions. And that's what we see in the top left. And then on the top right, we see in the program also it was mixed use and we wanted to have all of these amenities and public amenities that people could see from far away. So that created other decisions and other conclusions. And the sustainability meant rotating some of the buildings to take advantage of, of the winds or protect from the sun and so on. And so at the end, we had four directions. And again, we talked to the client, working with the client in collaboration, and, um, and then we came up with a solution. Interestingly, this, this project is a great example of a world that is interconnected. This project in particular is in Panama, and, and the clients were Colombians. Because in Colombia, in uh, Bogota, for example, they have seen the wonders that public space can make. So these Colombian clients saw an opportunity in Panama and brought their wisdom and experience and knowledge of how they thought this could happen in Panama, which is, is not very normal. And so we collaborated together, people from Colombia, people from Panama, and collaborated in, to make a, uh, a project in the scale of this. It's a very large scale project in terms of the city. So we, of course, continue with sustainability analysis, again, all separately, but then combine. And then this is the project. It's a beautiful project that at the end of the day, when you see it, has the, you can see, you can trace the analysis from the context where you can see all this retail and, and, and how the sidewalks mix and come in, into the site or, or the project. You can see the programs very clearly identified by their curtain wall and the, and the for example, the orange uh, staircases that uh, are not just colored because they are the result of this analysis in which we decided that it was important to express the different uses and the different uh, aspects of the building because we wanted to express that this building was mixed use. So again, that's not because I wanted, it was because in conversations with the client, we started to uh, analyze um, what were the hopes and the missions of each one of these pillars, context, program, and we mixed it in a different way. These are, for example, those amenity levels. I want to be there for sure. And that's not something that I just, I want to have an amenity in the middle. Boy, no, it, it came out of the conclusion of a very radical, rational, and pragmatic study of what the program should look like, and then mixed with the other pillars in this system that we have in the office. And these are, for example, other views of the project. Again, how it mixes with the with the with the sidewalk, for example. This is another, and I think I have two more projects, and that's it. Uh, this is another project in which this is in Medellin, in Colombia. Those of you who have not been to Colombia or Medellin, it's a, definitely a place to go and to visit. It's beautiful. Uh, this project again was um, we challenged it. We basically did the same type of study an analysis in which we use the system in terms of the context. We look at what the context tells you. We look at the program. We look what the program, what the best result for the programmatic uh, realities that we had for that project. That project was a mixed use project in which we had restaurants, bars, we had all types of retail and we had a hotel. And then sustainability, we also analyzed and and the sustainability meant to do some moves, some formal moves in the project, which are not arbitrary, are the result of the what we thought were the best solutions or results to what the complexities of the of the sustainability sustainability were. From again a narrative that comes specifically from Medellin and that site. So again, same type of study. And again, we mix it with the client working in this system to morph, to somehow morph these four pillars. And so for example, here, this is a, just a quick analysis. You can see how 
through the program because we had wanted balconies, but we also wanted the shade from the sun. We did this displacement that created the balconies at the same time, the sun that was part of the um, results results that we, we obtained from the sustainability study. So again, all of that, uh, a result that was not capricious, that was not just arbitrary, but again, the result of a real radical and rational study. This project is in construction right now in Medellin. It's really beautiful. These are just some views of how the program, you can easily and clearly see how in the top, we have one type of program, which is a rooftop bar and a rooftop bar uh, restaurant. In the middle, we have some, another type of use, and in the bottom, we have a, a different type of use. So those views, those those uses are expressed, and then we in, we in, in, uh, superposed uh, or imposed on top of this beautiful project the poetry, which again you need to go to uh, Medellin, but it's full of nature, it's full of trees and the organic patterns that nature and only nature can have. And so this project is completely embedded, interconnected to its nature and of the locality of Medellin. And we studied the forms and the textures and the patterns that come from the animals and the, and the vegetation that is from Medellin. And then we used it as part of the, uh, as part of the forms uh, we, that we superimposed again into the architecture. And it's, to me, it's like a friendly parasite or something. But not just because I wanted to, it's like a bug or something it has like legs and antennas and it looks like it's an animal, but it, it really just comes out of this analysis, poetic anal analysis, which was again, a part of this creative system. And again, uh, I, I'm doing this quickly just so you can see how different projects can all be uh, submitted to the same type of rigor uh, and the same type of um, analysis. And so in this case, this is a bank, uh, uh, which had, again, very particular contextual realities, a very particular program. This bank this is the headquarters of the bank who had very particular uh, types of needs they had in terms of sustainability, very clear, you know, where the North is, the South is, that we had to study that very much. And in the poetry, also very, very clear that I'll, you know, I can, I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more. So in terms, so I'm just picking up on the poetry. I could talk forever in each one of these that I'm not gonna elaborate because it would take too long, but I just wanna, for example, highlight the poetry. This project is in front of the most important street uh, that connects the city. So we recognized in re really from the first moment that that was the facade that had the most potential to communicate. At the same time, it was the, the, the facade in which you, get, you got the strongest uh, incidence of the sun and it had to be protected. This is a, most of the projects I've showed, you know, even though I've not mentioned it, they're lead, uh, lead certified buildings. And so in the models, we came up with that that had to be protected. So the combination of the poetry of having this possibility of communicating, doing an artistic installation in a place that craves art and, and creativity what with the same idea of um, of sun uh, protecting from the sun, then we did what you see on the right, which is all of these parametric designs that are inspired uh, from local motives. And basically they're implemented, we have the, the, the facade moves with motors and throughout the day, they just move to the exact position that they need to have in order to protect the building from the sun. Uh, so throughout the day, the, move, the building moves to regulate its facade and controls the heat intake. But at night when there's no sun, but people are coming from work and there's so many people in front, then it has, it moves in, 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 in different ways and all the different designs, 64 designs that you see on the right or in the left on the, of the screen, I'm not sure where you see it, but, and it's impressive. People drive in front of the building every day with the expectation of how does this building look today? It's amazing. And so again, all of that just shows you two things. This is, I, I, I could just talk about this the entire lecture, but to me, this is a very good example of what interdependent is. To me, this is a facade that is interdependent with its nature because only because of its nature and the analysis of nature where we did we decide to do something like this. This is a solution. This is a tool uh, in order to, to connect yourself or interconnect the building with nature. At the same time, the way it was made 
It was completely interdependent. It has motors from Germany. Uh, the the actual the actual louvers that move are from Spain. We had also from Europe specialists that created the software because this doesn't exist. All of we we had to mm, invent the software with Europeans that are specialists. Then we had local uh, engineers and designers this, uh, work on it. We had basically from everywhere in the world. If we did not have a world interdependent, willing to share knowledge, this would have been impossible to make. So this is again interdependent in so many, so many ways. And it's beautiful to see. These are more pictures of the building uh, built, uh, which is, it, it was awarded the most important project in the country uh, about a, a couple of years ago. <laughs> and these are again, some, some pictures of the project. And, 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 and again, that atrium that for example is there is not because I went to the atrium, is the result of the analysis of the program and sustainability where we didn't want to have columns or darkness. And, and again, it was the response of a very critical analysis that we did with our system. These are more pictures. And that, this is, I think, the last to finish. Let me see the time. Uh, to finish, we have a, an incredible uh, project, which I wanted to share with you because um, Natalia, as I was mentioning, we are architects like you and, and, and I'm sure everybody listening who have who crave and are really passionate about design and about showing the potential of design. And at some point in my life, I noticed that it was great to make a tower because yes, the people in the tower had the opportunity of experiencing design, and that was great. And I could we could have you know improved the life of those in that building and perhaps hopefully give pride if the building is really nice to those you know in the city. But I realized that the greatest potential that architecture had was in urban design. And it's not so easy to design in the scale of the city because that is reserved for government projects. And you know, in my, our practice was more, more based in private sector. But there was this opportunity for us to design in a really interconnected, interconnected city and, and project, which, uh, which was this project which we did a competition and we won to redesign a, a, a district in the, the entire central district of the city of Panama uh, and, and redesign everything about it. We redesigned the electrical system, the communication system, which was put underground, the sewage system, the portable water system, the rain, every single system in the city and interconnected with every single department of the city from the firemen, the people who pick up the garbage, the, the mayor's office, the, the public works, every, every single entity in the, in the country with, of course, the public. Uh, and this was an amazing opportunity for us to learn how to collaborate and to work in a very, very um, large scale scene. And so this is a project that we did a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago, and we completely changed the way the city worked in this area. We still, very controversial, very controversial. You, if you ask about this project, some people will tell you they hate it because the project, let me see where that slide is. You can see here on the left, everybody could park their car everywhere they wanted. And we changed it to the one in the right where everything was very straight You have one way. And so people that liked parking the car everywhere hated the project. But those who, who really liked public space and to walk and have trees and have benches to talk, love the project, very controversial. But uh, we were very happy because it has inspired an entire nation and showed the potential of public space, particularly in Latin America, where rich and poor are so divided that they never meet uh, sometimes in a lifetime. And so we wanted to do public space where poor and, and rich could meet, where young and old could meet, where people with disabilities are just as equal as people without, and basically a space for everybody that could uh, that could bond. And it was a, it's a beautiful uh, project that we did again, and interconnected again with all the different components of the city, from parking meters to ramps to lighting to Wi-Fi, underground sidewalks, uh, recycling, all the garbage uh, collection of the city. We had to study tourism, uh, the local economy, garbage everything. 
And the project, these projects, these models are not from the finished uh, state. It's, it's, uh, it was just finished recently, but you can already tell a little bit of how we created all these very ample spaces for people to, to be able to move in the city, to navigate. And the trees were just planted small, but now they're really, really big. Um, and it's really, really special. Just And with this, I'm going to end and just tell you that it's sometimes sad because we did all this amazing project with these bollards uh, that basically, because it's level, where you walk and where the cars go, it's, it's, a, it's level. There's not like a step to, to separate the car from the pedestrian. The way we separated the car from the pedestrian was throughout this with these bollards that basically guided the car well. And it was perfectly done, but again, in one way. And they removed every single bollard uh, because they said the cars could not see it. And they put these ugly dividers uh, between the sidewalk and the street. Because again, people could just, uh, are, were not ready to, to separate themselves from the car uh, because we were doing a pedestrian friendly, totally focused area and people were still trying to put their big four by fours. And so, um, Sometimes maybe we're a little bit too much ahead, uh, but it's super fun to try to make great, uh, great changes. So again, that's my last uh, um, um, slide. I guess my conclusion would be, again, that I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be talking about an interdependent city uh, because I believe is the greatest thing that humanity has and architecture and architects are a great and very important um, piece of an interdependent city. Through our work, we can, we can build or we can destroy. And I believe architects, um, and I hope we are being part of the, uh, uh, the change. And, and again, just when we work with engineers and we work with the city, it can only be done through collaboration. So that's it. Well, Eduardo, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. It's very enriching. Um, you know, it's great to see the work that you have been doing all these years. Uh, it definitely has so much richness in different ways. You started uh, presenting your office so simplistically in, in a way that, you know, you see those uh, images that shows how you work. And then they, you know, when we see then what you get to do afterwards is uh, impressive. So um, one of the things that I've seen by working with you is how you collaborate and how um, easy you make collaboration. Um, you know, you're collaborating now with the New York City Architecture Biennial, and that's an example for me working directly with you of um, an easy going collaboration, the warmness uh, that you put on everything that you do, the same as Ana Maria, um, makes the, the collaboration first of all easy. So from there, you can see the result of your work. You know, like um, if you're collaborating well with, with um, your clients, a project move forward a much smoothly, faster, and gets better results. So that's obviously seen there. Thank you. Yeah, so the design also reflect that collaboration and, and that uh, interest for the environment, as you show that building in Colombia that has almost like a skin of an animal there, or you know, as, as you see the, the bank that, that has um, um, more to do with with the environment in terms of, of closing and you know a, a living building that um, it's really hard to achieve. It's really hard. I, I worked in amazing companies for all of them doing some mechanical um, buildings are extremely hard to first of all uh, sell it to the client, you know, so to, to say, well, you know, you're going to maintain a mechanical building and, um, and because you have to really see the benefits and, and, and it's environmentally friendly too when it comes to how you control the, the interior, um, you know, 
uh, the, the air in, in the interiors and in the heat gain and all that through a living uh, facade. So uh, congratulations for that. And um, questions would be, you know, how do you see yourself collaborating uh, with other, um, you know, other, not company, but other consultants? Uh, how do you do that? Uh, what type of consultants do you use? And, and you know, or you do those um, analysis, uh, you know, uh, internally in your office? Do you have a team, a research team in your office? And then after that, I'll give um, the um, questions to Miguel, who is uh, waiting for us, Jose Miguel. Uh, well, see. thank you, Natalia, for all your generous words. I can only tell you that it's very difficult, very difficult not to have an ego. Of course, we all do. But I, I have learned that it's a lot more fun and a lot more, um, and one can be a lot more successful if one, you know, tries to be humble. Just be kind and, 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 and work hard. And, and when you do that, collaboration is a lot, a lot easier. And also the cracking of the egg, even though it's just a funny picture that I had there, is key to have the, uh, the clients buy into what we do. Everything that we do, uh, 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 I only showed you a few projects, but our projects are known for the being very high end, very high design and very expensive. And so the reason why we can get that and clients to pay for it is because they feel they are part of the solution. And I've always tell them, I'm just a servant. I'm just here to serve with my knowledge, the, object, the objectives of the client. And so when they are part of, for example, that facade was very expensive as you can imagine. And a lot of people would say no from the first day because of maintenance issues. But if, if you put them, you make them a part of the project and they see and they understand the payback in terms of electric bills. If they understand the impact of giving art installation to a city and what that makes to an entire society and what that makes to your brand. Once you talk about these things with no ego, but just trying to be part of, then clients jump on board and they're the ones defending it. So that's, has, that's how what it has worked for me. And, and it has worked well for me in, in a place where, uh, because I am in the developing world, I'm in Panama where there's very limited resources. And I've been able, I feel very proud that I've been able to convince clients to believe in the power of architecture and facades and details. Um, and I think Peli had it right in that when you work with good clients, then you get good results. And we actually say no to most of the clients that come and knock on our door. We're very selective. But you had well, another question and I don't, I, oh, my, 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 who do I work with? We actually do, let me tell you, I'm very, I think take, take risks. You know, for example, when we were going to do design the city, this city is a huge part of the city. I knew zero of how to design a city, but I said, I can do it. And the reason why I, I had complete belief in that we could do it is because, of course, I'm going to call everybody that knows how to do it. And we call the best engineers in the world. We call the best every, every people who have done it 10 and 15 times. And so, you know, then it's easy. It's much easier. And so we work with engineers and architects and landscape designers and from everywhere in the world. Well, actually, one of the things that I saw in your buildings, and, and you mentioned Cesar Pelli's work a couple of times, uh, you know, I saw how much important was for you, uh, the people. And, you know, something that comes, you know, from a school of Cesar Pelli. And actually, I work also with um, Kevin Roach, who both come from the school of Aerosarin. And, and you know, your, your buildings reflect a little bit um, what they were bringing to their buildings, you know, like the care for the people, for the, the space, for, um, you know, that bank that has this large atrium. Uh, it's just uh, similar to what, you know, Erosarinen was bringing, and then I saw it in uh, Cesar Spelli's building and uh, Kevin Roach buildings, and now mm -hmm. I see it on your building. So it seems like it comes from a school and mm -hmm. in a good school. So I'm glad that you are able to um, produce this type of work. Well, so I'll leave the, the floor to Jose, who is there with some questions too. Thank you. 
Hello, how are you? Uh, thank you very much Hi. for your uh, presentation. It was eye-opening to see all of this uh, interesting development that you're doing um, after all th this, this past you did. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I, I was super intrigued about the how you bridge uh, in the parametric design, the most engineered part of the design, we will say. Um, to the poetry and how that enables you to 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 collaborate more with your client and and different uh, engineers and construct and uh, construction companies uh, in in your practice. Mm -hmm. Well, the the first thing is um, that facade in particular um, was number one to convince the client that had that art had a purpose. And so that art was not just a decoration, but it had, it was important. So once they got that and they knew the potential and the responsibility they had by having that huge facade in a, such an important city, it was both great for them because they, they have, and then they, and, and understanding that basically we just brought a, a, a parametric design artist to use because the, the, the building is perceived in movement is perceived and uh, you don't see it in frontally, but you see it laterally. They used the, the it got inspiration from the way that you, uh, that you appreciate the, the, the work of art to do this. So it basically was done by, a, again, collaboration. I cannot, I cannot take credit for those designs. It was an artist that was, that was incorporated. The client liked them. Also, if you, I don't know if you noticed in the presentation, our presentation is like for kindergarten children. It's very simplistic, uh, and that's I think I've, I've learned is the best way to communicate. To because when sometimes our ideas are so sophisticated that we struggle to communicate, and so our graphic design has to be very clear, so that the the, the client sees it and buys into it. And then once you have a clear idea, working with it, doing the technicalities, if you have experience, is not difficult. The, the the problem is to to get support of the client to understand the conceptual role of what you're doing. And then doing it is, is typically just a matter of time uh, and yeah, getting the right team. Yeah, that, so uh, for me, that's super relevant because uh, in a way that this kind of tools also enable you to, to, to bring this more creative part and to show how actually you're going to execute and that these kind of things are also uh, enable us to perform more analysis in sustainability and even to pedestrian or like traffic, vehicular jams, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Well, this project is a lead, lead uh, I think it's lead gold. Um, and, and I think every single project I showed are lead certified. So we work with sustainability in Panama in particular. We are a very small country with very with abundant uh, beauty but very tiny so you you have you do two small bad moves and, and you know and it, it's major it's, 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 so you here have to it's a responsibility to protect nature sustainability is not a marketing you know tool here it's essential and so you know also clients understand that uh, i believe at least i don't know how it is where you live but i think we've we've come a, a long ways at the, at the beginning, I had to convince uh, the, the importance of sustainability. Nowadays, people understand it. They, they, they know it's important. They always ask for the payback, for sure. But, um, but not, people get it. People know it's important and, and know that their brands can gain or suffer from, the, from doing it wrong or right. Do you have also any callbacks to uh, if, if you maybe in, in hindsight, how you will manage the urban design in a different way? Yeah, that project was very, still is very controversial. Eduardo, I, I think you're breaking up yes. a little. You you froze a little bit. Um, just I, I just want to let you know that when you come back, we're gonna be closing this. 
And I, I don't know, Jose, if you have additional questions for him, but then Lance uh, will. Oh, I also think I have, uh, we have Mark Deer uh, coming to thank you, the audience as well. Um, and uh, so coming up, I am so sorry that Eduardo froze. <laughs> <laughs> it's very unfortunate. He, uh, I think he's probably trying to reconnect.